Hi, my name is Maria Bernadette Madel, and uh, today I have the pleasure to interview Dr. Andreas Bergthaler from the SAM Research Center of Molecular Medicine in Vienna, Austria. So Dr. Bergthaler did his PhD in immunology in Zurich, in Switzerland, under the supervision of Professor Hengartner, Nobel laureate Rolf Zinkernagel. And after his PhD, he did a postdoc in Switzerland and the United States. And after this, he became principal investigator at the SEM in Vienna, where he and his research group are focusing on molecular mechanism of inflammatory diseases. Welcome, Dr. Bergthaler. Thank you, Maria. So would you please tell us how did your interest in immunology begin? Hmm. Um, so I studied uh, not biology uh, nor human medicine, but I studied veterinary medicine. And uh, during these studies, I think somewhere after the second, third year, I, I became more and more interested in immunology. And, and as a consequence, I, I then, for one of my summer internships, I found a way to uh, join a laboratory of a very famous immunologist in Tokyo, at the University of Tokyo in Japan, uh, Tara Tsugo Taniguchi who is working on innate immune signaling on interferon regulatory factors. And this I think was the final kick I needed to be really sure that I, this is what I want to do for, for, for a career and a living. And I subsequently um, had the chance um, by some twists and turns to um, join uh, the laboratory of uh, Hans Hengarten and Rolf Zinkernagel, uh, the Institute of Experimental Immunology of the University Hospital Zurich and the ETH Zurich, um, as you mentioned already. And this was the first time that I got really uh, my hands and feet deep into immunology, doing basically um, mouse immunology um, by means of viral infections. So using uh, benchmark models of viral infections, uh, where we exactly know what happens under normal circumstances if you infect the mouse with this virus. It's a little virus called LCMV lymphocytic choremeningitis virus, which uh, for us humans is not really a, a big health threat unless you're pregnant or immunocompromised. Yet um, it has really served as a extremely important tool uh, to write uh, immunology textbooks. And I would say particularly T-cell immunology uh, chapters. Uh, it has uh, spurred and uh, supported three different Nobel Prizes. Most recently, the one uh, in 2018 by, by Allison and Honsho, um, who developed this idea of immunotherapy, of, of blocking uh, inhibitor receptors on the surface of T-cells, such as PD-1 and CTLA-4, which is all building on the concept of T-cell exhaustion. So that if the body is um, facing an excessive amount of antigen, which might be the case in case of cancer or in chronic infection, uh, those T cells uh, become exhausted. And this was first discovered in this LCMV mouse infection model. Just to again give an idea of how basic research feeds into translation, translational research and, and eventually into, into medicine. Um, and yeah, and there in Zurich, I, I, I kind of combined molecular virology. So we, we played around with the genome of this LCMV virus and then we stuck it into different mice, wild type mice, knockout mice, and we tried to ask very basic questions. What is the role of um, some genes of the virus? Uh, what is the role of antibodies? Um, how can the virus escape uh, T cell responses? Um, yes, and this was basically my, my doctoral work in Zurich. And after that, I, I, I joined uh, for a postdoctoral uh, stay the laboratory of Alan Derham, actually a South African uh, originally. And um, his lab um, back then was at the Institute of Systems Biology at the West Coast in Seattle, Washington in the US. And this is where I became more familiar with uh, systems level approaches to uh, immunology and inflammation. So using techniques such as um, back then it was, um, it was arrays to do um, transcriptome analysis, um, but also mass spectrometry to look at how proteins change, um, also quite a bit of bioinformatics and applying this to other viruses such as influenza virus. And in 2011, I, I moved back to Vienna where I 
uh, became a principal investigator at my research group. And there we are um, studying the interplay of pathogens with the host and the immune system and how this um, um, can lead to disease. And what are you focusing now on your research in your own team? So what are current projects that you're focusing on? There are different ones. There are some exotic ones, um, such as we have been working on transmissible cancers of Tasmanian devils, but I will not uh, talk about this right now. Um, but it's basically, I would say, two major uh, pillars in the lab uh, at the moment. The one is immunometabolism. So understanding how does inflammation and, Im and immune response uh, interact and influence metabolism and vice versa. And we're particularly interested in systemic immunometabolism. So not just what is happening in the Petri dish, but actually what is happening in our case, it would be in the mouse. Um, what is happening in the mouse if it encounters a virus? Um, and this has a very broad range of um, questions that are at first sight, maybe not very immunological to start with. So for example, when we look into the liver, we don't care so much at, the, at first, at least about Kupfer cells and, and T cells, but we actually ask another question. Uh, what is the role of hepatocytes in uh, shaping the immune response? And same goes, for example, with, with fat uh, tissue, which is a, a very important uh, storage organ for energy. We'd like to understand how do atipocytes interact with other immune cells and, and shape um, the way how organisms get rid of a virus or become tolerant or, or, or develop immunopathology. And, um, and so it's this broad angle of immunometabolism where we really try to get a better holistic view of, of the changes, the pathophysiological changes in a whole organism upon infection. Um, and there we have different uh, special areas. One is the liver for sure. And, and, and we had some um, important um, studies there where we, um, for example, could show how an antiviral cytokine such as type one interferon reprograms the metabolism of the liver including such central metabolic pathways as the urea cycle, which is important to detoxify um, ammonia from, from your system. But we're also uh, studying um, a very prevalent but uh, ill-understood disease called cachexia, something where your body wastes away. And you might be familiar with this uh, from chronic, chronically infected patients that are AIDS or, or tuberculosis uh, positive, um, or also terminal cancer patients where basically these people are emacerated, they have lost uh, significant amounts of their body fat and body, uh, the muscle mass. And importantly, it cannot be reversed by just force feeding them. So it's really some intrinsic metabolic and also inflammatory processes that prevent this from, from getting reverted easily. And, and we made an, an interesting, I think an important uh, discovery uh, showing that um, immune cells such as CD8 T cells can actually drive cachexia in the context of chronic infection. And this was uh, new and surprising. And, and we're currently trying to see how, how much does cachexia in the context of infection differ from uh, cancer associated cachexia. And our working hypothesis is that even though cachexia looks like a disease and yes, you're losing weight and, and and it might kill you in, in many instances when, it, when you think about cancer. But we, we somehow believe that maybe cachexia is an evolutionary conserved program that in the context of infections actually allows the body to, to reshuffle and redistribute uh, energy and, for example, fuel the developing immune response. And, and this is something that we're currently studying. This is the first pillar. And the second pillar is that we're very interested in how pathogens evolve. Um, so kind of coming from the other side. The, the first thing was rather the host, and now it's a pathogen. And we have been over the last years uh, investing and developing uh, several um, uh, programs to understand how chronic viruses evolve in an organism. None of this is published yet, but interestingly, uh, in February, when this year, when the SARS coronavirus um, came around, we decided eventually to repurpose this viral evolution pipeline. And so we kind of a bit of a flying start, we started to sequence uh, SARS-CoV-2 genomes in Austria. And, and we've by now sequenced more than 1,100 samples. And we've just published uh, this Monday a, 
a paper in Science Translation Medicine where we reconstructed some of the super spreading events and, and I think we could really gain some fundamental insights into both how mutations emerge, but also how this pandemic virus is spreading and is getting transmitted within the human population. That's very interesting and also congratulations to this uh, great manuscript. Um, but what would you consider as one of the biggest struggles or difficulties in your research? Hmm. Well, I think it's not a surprise for anyone in, in research that our life is riddled with difficulties, right? And it happens on a daily basis where experiments don't work. It happens on a maybe a bit of a bigger picture where you have competition and you're getting scooped or there are other uncertainties when it comes to funding and, 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 and these type of things. Um, I don't know. Um, I don't think it's a difficulty, but I think what's really important is to keep an eye on a well-functioning team as a PI. And I think this is, I think just as important as the actual science. And it's prop and I think it's a prerequisite for doing cutting edge science. And I think it's also something as a young PI back then, I probably underestimated how, how much pleasure you can get from, from working with people, training them, identifying their strengths and weaknesses and, and kind of treating everyone in a different individual way. Right. And, and I think this is, it's a challenge, I think, and with every new person coming or leaving, it changes the group structure. And I think this is something that um, I think is really, really important for success of, of uh, in science and beyond science, for sure, as well. I agree. This is one of the most important things, I think. Um, so one last question, which is more general. So what would be your general advice for students or young career scientists? do what you love. I think um, don't go by what people predict you that you can get a job in or, or get rich, um, but really to, to, follow, um, to follow your vocation and to really try to, um, um, I think you're best in, in, in doing what you love doing. And I think in that sense, um, getting as much advice as possible uh, from also more senior people, I think makes a lot of sense, but at the end of the day, you need to call it, right? And I think, don't be afraid if you go off the beaten track um, and don't be afraid if you're maybe having a, I don't know, not always following the mainstream. I think there's, particularly in science, there's a lot of room for uh, being creative, for developing your own style. And um, I think also some of the, the most important findings are are sometimes about being prepared to see them, right? Where others would, would kind of ignore it because it's a failure of an experiment. Um, if you're ready to grasp this opportunity and be flexible enough to jump on this, um, you might be the one who unravels it, even though others have seen it before, but they just couldn't put the pieces in the puzzle together. So I think uh, don't be afraid and be fearless. All right, so thank you very much, Dr. Bergtaler for taking your time and answering our questions. Um, we and Immunopedia, thank you so much. All right, thank you. Thank you very much for this great opportunity.